Okay, all of this. So the meeting is open and the first item on the agenda is to review the, me uh, the minutes of our August 12th meeting. And I read them. I did not see any typo or other errors. Uh, anybody have comments on the minutes? No one else? Nope. Okay. Can I have a motion to accept them? And Tim, you weren't here, so you can't vote on them. We have a motion to accept them. I'll move to accept the minutes of the August 10th meeting. I'll second it. Okay. All in favor? Maureen? Aye. Steve? Aye. Nancy? Aye. It was August 12th, by the way. Sorry. <laughs> okay. August. Did I say August? I said the 10th because I was Oh, no, it's August 12th. I was looking at something else here that was 8108 from 2020. Okay. So. okay, so the first item under old business is the Amherst College Institutional Biosafety Committee uh, request, which we um, discussed and we voted it by a roll call. But I'm bringing it up because the old recommendation, a recombinant DNA technology and infectious biological agent regulations are from April um, 2008, April 17th. And I was wondering if we want to review and revise these um, Yeah, well, I think what Alex was asking is whether people could come from outside of the town of Amherst, and presumably they can, yes. but that yes. has to be voted on, yeah, I guess. Yeah, so do we want to look at the regulations as they were um, done on, you can see it, April 17th, 2008, and do we want to review them and make the, uh, uh, the amendments or revisions to them? And would someone like to do the lead on that? If all it takes is that one thing, I'll be happy to do that. Sure. Okay. Yep. So is it more than that, though? Is are we thinking these might be, you know, significantly out of date? Um, we, we should read them and see if we. I looked at them quickly, mm -hmm. but I didn't. I I just wanted to bring it up today. So I think maybe all of us should read them. Yeah. And see if we want to do any other revisions because they are thirteen years old. The other question. Do you have electronic? Is, sorry. Do you, have, yeah, do you have an electronic copy? It's it's listed under our regulations. Right. On right. The, okay. The, on okay. The website. Good. Yeah. And then we should look at other towns if they have newer ones to see. I mean, you were saying something, Maureen. Yeah, I just noticed in in the letter from Alex that there was also the um, how do they <laughs> have they been paying their fee or like for right. this or have we been actually inspecting the labs and that kind no, of thing no. <laughs> that's why i think we need to re look at them to review and revise them yeah so i think the first step is that we all look at them and read them for next meeting then decide what we want to do for revision uh who would take the lead for revising them does that make mm -hmm. sense sure you have any other comments Or Tim? No. Nancy, can you repeat the name of the, um, the regulation just so I can? Yes, it is called Thank you. Uh, Recombinant DNA Technology and Infectious Biological Agent Regulations of the Board of Amherst Board of Health. Thank you. And they don't have but I remember being there doing this and it was effective April 17th, 2008. And it okay. says the board shall annually review these regulations <laughs> and may make such amendments as it deems necessary and appropriate. Okay. Um, I do not think we have reviewed them since 2008. Mm -hmm. So we need to review them 
and make any amendments. And then I think we should have the people who, who were involved sign it too. I'm surprised that wasn't done, but that was 13 years ago. So we will all read them and see where we're our next step in revising them and making amendments for the next meeting. Can we, I think I need a motion. Can I make the motion as chair? Okay, thank you. Um, I move that we all uh, review the recombinant DNA technology and infectious biological agent regulations, and that we um, look at making any amendments or revisions as necessary and appropriate. So the first step is that we'll all review them and then make our comments at our next meeting. I'll second that. Okay. All in favor, Maureen. Aye. Tim. Aye. Steve. Nancy, aye. Okay, thank you. Next is the racism as a public health crisis. And I wanna thank everybody for their work on this. And we have the 2001 draft. Did everybody get it? With the, uh, I started it, Steve did revisions, Tim did excellent revisions too, and Maureen added um, references. So where would you like to go with this tonight? Why do we use Tim's draft? Because he has specific suggestions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I really liked your suggestions, Tim. I thought it um, enhanced the work that was done. What do other people think? There's that one question about just the wording. So in the, in, the race, in the paragraph that starts, racism has played a central role. Yes. You have a question? Yeah, so the sentence that Tim added, marginalized groups are disadvantaged in all the social determinants of health and then I don't understand that next phrase. I think maybe you mean. There's a word make, missing. <laughs> making uh, racism a fundamental cause of ill health, maybe, or some, something's missing there. What is it that's a fundamental cause of ill health exactly? Uh, the, the disadvantaged status of marginalized groups. So I don't know uh, if it's not clear. Sounds like maybe marginal groups would be a fundamental cause, which we don't mean. So how about saying, just add, say that, um, darn, I lost it. Set. How about after the word, you know, after determinants of health, say making racism a fundamental cause of ill health, is that valid? Or and oh. such disadvantages are a fundamental cause of ill health or something. I don't know. Uh, yeah, that would be. Yeah. Or we could we could make it the marginalization a fundamental cause of ill health. Just read the whole sentence. So marginalized groups are disadvantaged in all the low social determinants of health. And marginalization of particular groups is, a, you know, the fundamental cause of ill health. Or... So Here we're referring to marginalization, right? Mm -hmm. I think, yeah. Marginalized groups are disadvantaged in all the social determinants of health. Making marginaliz making this marginalization a fundamental cause of ill health. Yes. Okay. okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. And um and under um a, addressing um. Uh, the racial and ethnic health uh, inequities. We had questions whether uh, bullet 
three and bullet four were repetitive. And I think uh, the new rewording of bullet three clarifies that. Yes, yes, it makes it much better. Yeah. Yes. yes, so that was my thought there. Yeah. Now, Tim, I think in the margin, you were saying to expand on the definition of racism quite a lot. Did you mean to put that all of that in there? The whole thing, because it will greatly enlarge that thing, I think, that part of it. Oh, uh, this is coming from a publication, you know, rather than from a website or a blog. Ah, so good, directly, yeah. Yeah, that is the difference, you know. Uh, okay, okay, yeah. But we have the uh, reference to Jones, you know, 2016. Yeah. So are you happy just leaving uh, Kamara Jones's definition without expanding it? Tim? Uh, I'm fine with that, you know. But this one looks like it has much more clarity in terms of this bulleted points. But, but it, it's left to the panel to decide you know, whether you want more details or... See, because I think... I was using my iPad and I did not get that other piece on my iPad. Oh, it's uh, a comment in the margin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wait a minute, let me go back here. Um, Ah, now I'm going on. I can't seem to be get, I can't seem to get it. It's not all opening up for me unless I, I, I leave this and go on my other computer. I'm and, um, it. I could maybe send it to you. Let me try this. Okay, send that to me. I'm just gonna make put it on a document and see if it works. For some reason. I don't know what, okay. It might take me longer to do this than it's worth. But. <laughs> I'm just, I, I, all I'm getting is the Amherst College Board of Health, Board of Health Minutes, H926 Minutes, and PFAS. The other ones aren't coming, the other stuff is not coming up for some reason. Uh, I think I'm just sending it right now, my email. All right, Doc. Okay. I think that's the right place. It starts with the public, okay. American Public Health American Association. Public Association. Yes. Um, asserts that racism is a social system with multiple dimensions, individual issues, and two system And the strength of that, that just continues, I'm sure, as before. There's just that was truncated, but it's the same as before. Okay. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Okay. And like when, when it's printed, would it be bulleted? Like you want to keep the bulleting or just make it semicolons? I think it's I, easier to read when it's bulleted, but yes. Okay. I agree. Yeah. Okay. And it makes it stand out. Good. Okay. Okay. So we're happy with the edits. 
Any more discussion or should we move to accept this? Comments? Discussion? Someone want to make a motion to accept it with the edits? Probably. <laughs> go ahead, Steve. Or, or go ahead, go ahead, Tim. Go ahead. You do it, Tim. Oh, uh, yeah. I would like to make a motion to accept the statement on racism and public health uh, with the modification suggested. Okay. I second board. that. Okay. Um, it's been the motion, it's been seconded. Any further discussion? Okay, so we'll vote. Tim. Aye. Maureen. Aye. Steve. Aye. Nancy. Aye. Okay. I'll take care of writing it up and getting it uh, getting it formatted. Okay, and then we'll have to figure out signing it, whether we go over to the health department to sign it. Yeah, because we haven't had any instructions on now that we're all virtual can we virtually sign things mm. certainly, certainly if we have an electronic signature we could insert it all in there if everybody sends me their signature but i don't know if that's what you want to do hmm. i have a scanned copy of the signature i can send it to you oh, so do you want that nancy okay so what i do is i do my signature i scan it and send it to you that's oh yeah I mean, but if you don't have it, maybe it's not worth it. But if uh, most people would have one, so I don't have it, them. but I can do it. Okay. We we can always send someone out if you want. Um, that works, Lillian. Or I can go over to Steve's and sign it. <laughs> Signing party. It lives around the corner. Okay. Well, I'll I'll try it, and if it works, if not, I'll walk over to Steve's and sign it. Yeah, I'll, I have I don't have one either, but I think it seems like a good idea, and maybe I should have one. <laughs> I think in ten or years or so years ago, I tried to do that, and it wasn't so simple. I think it's probably was, a lot easier yeah. now. <laughs> That's what happened to me. Okay, so I will work on that. Uh, Board of Health member appointment update. Now, Angela Mills sent out dates for the interview of the candidates, and that is in the process of being finalized. I put together um, questions for me to ask, and I don't know if people, I have a whole variety of questions. I haven't finalized what ones. I don't know if any of you have questions you want me to ask, or if you want me to tell you what kind of questions I have. Well, so is this with some members of the town council then? Is that what we're talking about? That It's with Paul, someone, Jim? This is a community representative of some sort? Yes, a community representative and Jen and myself. Let me find the email from Angela. Um, uh, oops. Ay, ay, ay. Oh, I was looking in the wrong one. Angela, there we go. Date for interviews. That went out on September 7th. Jim Pistrang, myself, and uh, Jen. That's what I have. Do you have any more? Um, read the residency advisory committee. Yeah, I think that's it. 
I think the only thing to be concerned about is if several people are going to be interviewed, it's oh. only fair to fix the questions and make sure everybody yeah. gets asked the same questions. But if only one yeah. person is being interviewed, I would just leave it up to the people involved, I would say. Yeah, so I think what we should, but I could always ask, I would ask the same questions to every interview. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I didn't know if you wanted any input on the questions. Mine are like, what do you know about the Board of Health? Why are you interested in becoming a member? Um, um, what experience do you have that relates to our mission? And what experience do you have that will be of value to the board? And how much time will you be able to contribute? Other questions I had are, what do you think are good characteristics of a Board of Health member? And what does public health mean to you? Are some of the questions. Oh, those are good. Mm -hmm. Do you like those questions? Yeah. I can type them up and send them to you. Yeah, I think those are really good, Nancy. Okay. Okay, so I put that together. What I will do is I will type them up so that I ask the same questions to every candidate. Hmm. One, one thing you can also think about their expectations. Um, okay. Terms, you know, because often that be also becomes important. <laughs> mm. What are your expectations related to what? In terms of um, compensations or the in terms <laughs> of the workload. Uh, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> general, general information, because I think we would like to know yeah, there's no what, what the candidate <laughs> is thinking, you know, uh, okay. in the, you know, before the you know, the interviewer. So. Uh, oh yeah, and what are their ex of orientation? Okay, good. I'll add something like that. Thank you, Tim. Okay. Anything else now? Um, we have several things, and then we have a bit under topics not anticipated that will take time. So um, the new discussion is the um, H926. Uh, we have a letter from um, Lenore Brick. And Nancy. So, sorry to interrupt. Lenore wants, uh, is going to be making the meeting, but she says about 5.45 is the earliest she could jump on. Okay, so we can move to other things. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the Craig's door shower variance is going to be postponed till October meeting. And um, Jen, do you want to talk about review the Board of Health and Health Department webpage? Yeah, so I just wanted to um, let folks know we've got a lot of input that our um, health department and Board of Health um, web pages needed a little revamping. So we really take this very seriously. Revamping means, you know, it's not just uh, what it looks like, even though, you know, you want to see the information changing. But someone said it was really hard to find the Board of Health dates. So I can quickly go in and change things. So I changed um, a few pages. So one thing was the Board of Health page where people could really see the dates of the meetings. And I'll make sure that that continues on to 2022 um, with really clear links to the Zoom meetings. Um, beyond that, um, I also um, today, um, with the help of IT and Brianna, we went over, just did some gentle upgrades to the COVID dashboard. And maybe it's not even dashboard, but it's the cases of Amherst. So I'm not telling you you need to get it up. You can just sort of, you know, hear, hear me out. But I did want um, our information to have our current active cases, our confirmed case total, and then I really wanted to get some other information that could be compared to other people's dashboards, you know, packets of information that you could see from state to town to city. So we did put up the 14 day average incidence rate. 
Um, so that's something that'll be updated um, every week. It looks at 14 days, um, two weeks. Every week it looks two weeks back. So those are just some small steps that we did. My goal, and I just need a little more time to do this, is to put up a PDF with a real dashboard um, with real stats that people can see what's going on in Amherst. Because there's certain things that are hard to get from DPH. Um, so that's going to be something I'm going to be doing and putting up. Like, what is the death rate? You know, the death cases in, in Amherst. You know, it's 43. Do people know this? You know, I'd like to get that information up. You know, a big question we get is, um, do our cases include UMass, uh, Amherst College, and Hampshire mm -hmm. College? That is in one of the explanations. But I really just want to make it that you click on and you can see what's, what's going on. So just to answer that, our cases do include everyone who resides in the town, the geographic um, area of Amherst. But UMass, on their dashboard, they post staff, professors, students who are in the UMass community. So that means if they live in Sunderland or Hadley, they're counted on theirs. So that's very, I mean, it's clear, it's not clear, but it's nice to have information that you can transfer from place to place. So you can, you can sort of figure out where we are, where we've been, you know, what's our trajectory. So that's our COVID case count. Um, then just an extension of that is vaccine. It's um, something that you can go to COVID and then vaccine. Um, we did a little clinic um, vaccine uh, clinic update. And just to let you all know, it used to say we would sort of close for June, we're done, but we're going to be starting up our clinics again. Um, we actually are going to be, do, going to be doing a um, pop-up clinic, and that's going to be at Groff Park next Thursday. And so I know there's some volunteers on the board, so I'll be asking if anyone wants to help come do that. But that's, that's um, some outreach that we can do. Um, that is... Uh, I, uh, intramural football. I don't know if it's Pop Warner, but that really draws in a lot of folks from different communities, um, Belchertown, and then some different cultures that come to use the, the water, um, the, the nice water park there. So we're going to continue those um, pointed uh, vaccine clinics. I think it's really important to keep at the number of folks that we have not vaccinated yet. Um, so that's one of our missions. You know, the people that are hardest hit by the virus, you know, sometimes they're not the ones that have been vaccinated. So we're going to be continuing those. Um, one thing I want to interject is I have found it hard, and I imagine everyone's found it hard to figure out what's going on with booster doses and third doses. So just, you know, for clarity's sake, once we get the um, okay, we'll start up with those. But the FDA has not approved booster doses. You know, we heard it from Biden. We heard eight months, five months, hasn't been approved by the FDA. But the third dose for immunocompromised people has been approved. But we haven't helped those clinics because they're for folks that really have moderate to severe immunosuppressive diseases. So, so on to another topic that I, just, I, I don't. don't see the pop-up clinic coming up here. Oh, it's not on there. I'm sorry. Not on there yeah. yet. Okay. Yeah. okay. Okay. But you know what? Thank you. It's going to go up soon and it'll go here. And then I'll speak to Brianna in IT and we'll, we'll push it out or whatever the terminology. Okay. Right. And Thank try to you. do some advertising. Okay. Um, so one thing I have a question about the, how things will look, and I wondered, I, I don't, can't really look at it now and I'll do that later, but can yeah. you separate out the ones that are like non-college related? I mean, and I, I know you mentioned something about that, but it will the number say this, this many were Amherst residents who are not college students and this I, is, these are I, ones who are. Yeah, on our dashboard, we're, we, aren't going to be able to do that accurately. What we can do um, is we can put age groups up. So mm -hmm. I can run a spreadsheet and mm -hmm. do it by, you know, groups of, you know, five or three, and we can see where the, the, the okay. ages are. You know, we could get this information and it could be really exact, 
But um, the way that Amherst UMass puts their um, data in, it's, I, I always forget this, it's not REDCap, but it's another platform and the way it mixes with Maven, I think they have to manually input it. And when they're going really fast, it, it might not be accurate. They're great at what they do. Um, so we don't separate out that way, but we can do ages. Do you think that's useful? Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I just wondered, because Steve actually had a little graph that he kept last year with, he tried to make that uh, obvious, that's which, he would circulate, right, Steve? I don't know where yeah, you I can do that. I, I, you know, it would look good for a few months there, so I could go back to that, yes. <laughs> but I think, Jen is, I think maybe Jen is really, you know, I was just doing it from, where did I get that information? It was maybe readily you. available, but I think Jen is on, onto it, and I think maybe yeah. I'll do, let's, do I'll it by let's age. see what it looks like, yeah. 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 I'll, I'll see um, what I did, I forget. And, and, and then, whoops, it, would it be possible as you're doing this to get some community members periodically just to review it and have what they think of it? Yeah, that's a really great idea. Um, I, I don't I, know how I, you do it, but in the future, if you could work yeah. that out um, so that we could get community feedback to see yeah. how, how it yeah. is. Yeah. yeah, no, that's a really good point. And then just one thing is when the numbers are low, like let's say we're just, coming along at two or uh, you know mm -hmm. zero is that hopefully in the future. If we get one student, let's say we get one student at Amherst College, I think it's a, almost yeah. a HIPAA violation. Yeah. So you yeah. you say yeah. between zero and five students, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm not quite sure about that. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, and I, I know that one thing about websites is not a lot of, not everybody looks at them, but oh. it, it has a way. <laughs> As my way. mother does. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know we tried to use our health center website at Mount Holy to reach students, yeah. but they don't weren't really going there, you know. Yeah. And I was thinking about trying to reach some of the under um, served populations in Amherst. And I don't know mm -hmm. how many people in those populations sort of look at these kind of websites yeah. and what they might think of them if they did. Would they be have resources helpful to them? So that's yeah. maybe another source of trying to. Yeah, could we get a, a Facebook approved um, space? I, I, you know, I don't post on Facebook, but I look on Facebook. But then my 12 year old grandson said, Grandma, you don't use Instagram. I, I don't use Instagram. I don't know if that reaches other yeah. people, but yeah. I don't. And then yeah. what we can get town approved. Um, yeah. It's maybe just a thought for the future is how we use these tools to kind of reach people mm -hmm, that aren't mm -hmm. being reached now. You and know, I want to pull the community for what what would be most useful for them to get yeah. information. So that's a great idea. Um, I want to jump ahead and then I'm come. I'll come back. This is, but I hadn't thought of this. Um, we have a new volunteer in the Amherst Health Department. Her name is Juana, and she said I could say her name, Juana Trujillo. And she worked in the housing um, uh, 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 service here. And she's, um, she's uh, very hooked into the Latin uh, community, Spanish speaking. And she wants to do outreach for us. And I think she might be someone that can really help. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. She knows folks that haven't been vaccinated because they've said, oh, those clinics weren't for us, you know, so she's going to really help us um, with with many aspects. And that's something I hadn't thought of. So mm -hmm. now, is there any way you could have her and pilot her putting together something on a community health worker that then we can ask for funding for? Yeah, that's, you know, I, I like, she's just signed on, so I don't want to scare her off, but I really have, you know, hopes to, to keep her, you know, but here. Maybe and, and Keep and, track yeah. of what she's doing and then have that evolve so yeah. we can start requesting money. Yeah, um, yeah. Because we really need to have this funded in a permanent piece of our health department. Yeah, yeah. Um, I agree with you, you know, when, when COVID, you know, came hard at us, you know, last, uh, last March, 
you know, one thing, you know, I'll say for Julie Fetterman, what we had in place and for all of you, you know, the Amherst Human Service Network and all of our great colleagues and partners, you know, we really were able to sort of jump in and say, thank you, Amherst, you know, Senior Center for helping us with food and family outreach. And we were, we worked hard to get that set, but, you know, post COVID, or are we ever going to be post COVID, but just going for, you know, forward, uh, some like one is going to be really integral to what we do here. Yeah. And then, um, not that we need it now, but to, to think of this while you're while you're working on that. I know because we are the emergency contact for our grandchildren in Beltertown schools. Uh, last um, March, April, you know, in 2020, May, June, and I don't know how much farther, the public health nurse every week or every month had a update in English and I think it was also available in Spanish through you know that emergency town uh, announcement that maybe mm. think of um, because they they kind of kept the information out on that reverse 911 call or whatever yeah. I don't know what she actually used then she retired so and then it wasn't done but yeah. I found it very helpful um in March, April, and June of 2020. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point. There are a lot of great uses, yeah. Um, and then I'm just gonna say if um, Lenore Brick is on, uh, as a attendee, let me know, put your hand up and we'll, we'll shift back to you. Um, and then I'm just gonna say one more thing about our, our, our Board of Health page. Um, I mean, our vaccine page is that we're putting the Amherst vaccination rate up there. Um, so this is um, posted and we'll change it weekly. And there's a little asterisk next to it, but it says the individuals in Amherst with at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine is 76%. And this percentage has been calculated using DPH data. And here's a link to our calculation methods and with that, you can click to um, uh, a spreadsheet um, that has been um, uh, done with great care and calculation um, by Stephen George. So thank you for support with that. So I think that's my update with the Board of Health, um, Health Department webpage, but I wanna keep it fresh. Um, and appreciate any input. Steve, do you have anything to say about the vaccine rate? Yeah, the one thing I, I have to see it to make sure, but the wording, you shouldn't say that the rate is 76% or anything because it is, that's a kind of a model with some to, assumptions. Yeah. So yes. you would say that this is a, it's an estimate or a quantitative, an estimate using information from different sources because there is no single source that tracks students getting vaccinated in their home communities. We just shouldn't yeah, say so that the, the rate is 76%. It's what we okay. believe it is with reasonable assumptions. Okay, thank you so much. Cause I was really trying to, to, to put in there that, um, yeah. that we're really, this has been calculated precisely, yeah. but it's not, you're right. It's estimated to the truest uh, value using resources. Okay, thank you, Steve. And of course, if, I'm sure people on the Board of Health realize, but you know, the issue is that students are listed here um, basically through census that does not keep track of the fact that many were away and were vaccinated in their home communities where they probably gave their home community as their address. So they're incorrectly you know, um, elevating the, uh, the percentage in those communities and falsely reducing it in ours. Mm -hmm. Oh, excuse me, Steve, I didn't mean to override you. Peter, yep. Peter has his hand up. Did you have a question, Peter? Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi. My name is Peter, and I'm an Amherst resident. I I was just wondering. Peter, to would you Peter? Could you please I just say your full name? So just. Uh, are you willing yeah. to see you? Uh. Yeah. That's fine. Uh. Uh. Well. Yeah. I prefer just last initials, oh. but I can. Yeah. No. Don't worry Peter. about. It. Okay. I'll just say Peter. Okay. It's fine. Yeah. Just thinking uh, for the minutes. Yeah. 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 No worries. Yeah. Just Peter's fine. Or I can. Yeah. Good. I can always contact you individually. That's fine. Too. Um. That's fine. Yeah, but I just want to make a public comment about COVID measures, but I can jump in later if, if that's going to be discussed later on. I wasn't sure what point of the meeting that was going to be talked about, so I can always wait for that. 
about uh about prevention measures like masking and and um town policy on that yeah that'll be coming up peter yeah yeah, yeah. Right. no problem i'll jump in later then okay yeah no thank you um i have one question on the vaccine rate steve i haven't looked in the past week and a half do we have it by race too or just by age groups I think that if there is race, it's it's including all age groups. It's certainly not broken down by age. Not broken race, down anymore. We, yeah. Okay. Because okay, earlier I remember seeing uh, not age but race. It's broken up by age for sure, and then there's some racial information, but it's not the it's not the doubly broken down by age and race. No, but I'm wondering if we could put just the race information too. Separate. The the fact that a large number of people of color are are students, you know, and so then they're going to we're going to run into the same problem that it's going to underestimate that, and I don't know how we would ever figure that one out. But yeah, we could put okay. it there. It would be yeah, it's definitely going to be an underestimate because many students of color were not here and possibly got vaccinated elsewhere. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, thank you for all that work, Steve. Yeah. No, no problem. Yeah, it, it was it was fun doing with that with you. I really appreciate it. I learned a lot. I think that's what I have for the web page, um, and I don't know if Lenore is with us yet. Uh, Lenore isn't, but I um, let's see where is this. I got some other information that I'll just tell you if I, if I find it. Um, Amherst has a 20-year-old toxic chemical regulation. And then, oh, of course, where is this? I emailed Mike Morris. And he said right now that the uh, Amherst Regional School System uses an integrated pest management firm they adhere strictly to the state regulations for schools, which is a higher bar than other public spaces. Given that there aren't any local policies on this, um, we will adjust if the state changes their regulations. But we do have this um, toxic chemical regulations, which um, are 20 years old, so we should look at this and revise it April 9th 2001 and there again there are no signatures of who were part of uh, putting this together and I think all of that was done prior to Julie Fetterman being on the uh, being on the health department and I, I think that might have I can't remember when Julie came on but uh, but that I just thought I'd give you that information. I just had one thing to add. I, I remember this subject came up um, about pesticides and herbicides in the fall of 2019. And I kind of went back to what Julie found for us. Right. Um, and I guess the report was from uh, that there were no the glyphosate was not used at any of the schools. There was zero. There was some use in conservation areas um, and rare for poison ivy, but it it was seemed like it was rare, but it was zero at on school property. Yeah, that was with the whole roundup, and they used it yeah. very sparingly in the parks where kids might get uh, for poison ivy. Right. Yeah. So. So I just thought I would, um, and then I also, before um, it comes up, that the uh, H926 right now is, has been referred to the Joint Committee on Environment, Natural Resources and Agriculture, and it's in the committee. It's, that, that's what I found when I went and looked on online for the status, the status of the bill right now. So we're just gonna wait for Lenore. 
we should move on, I think. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, she's not here. So she will, she, when she comes, we can. We'll, yeah. we'll, so we'll go yeah. on to the COVID-19 um, update. Okay. So this morning I woke up and I thought I would give you just sort of an, a mild update on, you know, some gradual case increases. But I do want to let you know what we saw starting today. We had an additional 76 cases come in today. So overnight, we had 101 cases. Um, obviously, this is a huge increase, and we're very concerned about it. Um, uh, since September 1st, we've had 163 cases. Right now, we have 140 active cases. Um, so the 140 people are in isolation right now. Um, big increase. Total com uh, cases, 3,073. So up quite a bit um, from you know, September 1st was 2,910. Um, when you look at the incidence rate, um, I haven't calculated for these really large increases. I think it's going to be last two weeks ago, it was 6.6. .6. That's the number of new cases divided by the number of people. Um, it's going to be published uh, um, tonight, and it'll be saying 16.8. So that's a big jump in itself, but that does not take into account of this big uh, number that just came in. So when I look at the... Um, the age of these folks, um, it's all within the ages of um, not all, 140, um, 20 and 25. So it's fair to say these are mostly um, UMass or college undergrad students. So it's around around age 21. So what's happening now is, and I see Mindy's on, I don't know if she might have more information. But I know um, UMass Amherst, um, the leaders are talking about what their response is going to be to this. Um, there are certain things that they'll be able to discuss. Ann Becker and I have been speaking. Uh, she's the public health nurse there and public health um, uh, with Jeff Hiscock. Uh, I believe that's correct. And they're deciding uh, with the team what their responses are going to be. So some of the things that they can decide upon, and this hasn't been discussed with me, but it's gonna be things that they, I mean, the options are, you know, what do you have? You have vaccine, you have testing, you know, and then you have these other mitigation strategies. So, you know, one thing that they may be considering is they're not conducting any asymptomatic testing now. So that's an option that they might consider some kind of uh, like a routine cadence to their testing. Um, to get them through a surge or to start up again. So we'll see where they come back with that. You don't wanna do pulled testing if, it's, uh, if there's so many cases. So we'll see what they come back with testing. Um, you know, I just don't know what other mid, uh, strategies they might have. I don't know if they're gonna look at isolation beds. I think they said they had 129 ace isolation beds. Um, so what's going on with that, if they'll be reviewing that. But, you know, they've been a good partner and, you know, they've been on top of this. They've been communicating with, um, with me and the town and, you know, everyone really, uh, I, I don't want to say anyone thought there might, but we, you know, we thought there would be some bumps, but, you know, every case is a person and we know that. Um, and we, we, we know that um, these students, you know, they're, they're vaccinated and we thank them for being vaccinated. It's a wonderful thing. But now we're seeing that they can contract and transmit disease. So, so what are our next steps? So when I find out what's going on, I'll be sure to relay that uh, to the board and what I can you know, say to the public. But I think for the board tonight, we need to discuss what our steps are um, and what are we going to continue to do. Um, I do want to you know, say that the block party has been canceled. And that was done, you know, a few days ago, Tuesday. And that was done, the bid, the bid did that. They were heading that way. And then we spoke and it just sort of sealed the deal. 
or maybe it was sealed already, but that's a really interactive kind of community event. So it's not just casual um, you know, interactions. They really wanted you know, people interacting and playing. So that was a hard decision. I think it was a smart one. Something else that I'm doing is just gonna, I'm gonna be updating with the help of the inspectors with Ed and Susan um, in the inspection department, giving some reminders to businesses what best practices might be, just some tips. One thing you know that I'm hearing when I do contact tracing is people are like, man, I didn't know I had symptoms. It was just that I thought was just you know the usual sniffles or um, you know I thought it was just allergies. So let's get back to some basics. If you're sick, stay home. Everyone has to have a really low threshold of identifying symptoms. Um, you know, masks, you know, if you see someone and they looks like they have the same mask on from three days ago, you know, let's change masks. You know, what's the progression of masks that we can have? Uh, you know, a double cloth, you know, a good procedure mask, uh, you know, a procedure and a double. Um, KN95s are not needed for you know, normal interactions, but if they're used in circumstances, that will be, that will be appropriate, whatever that may be. Um, so that's one thing. And then I think, so tonight, I think we need to speak about um, the board and what we can do to our mask uh, amendment. And with this big um, increase, one thing I did do is I spoke to the contact tracers at UMass and I said, you know, tell me what you're seeing. So they said there's a lot of activity in many places um, around, uh, you know, town that's popping up in different venues. But what they're seeing is that there is a communal uh, uh, point of that is that people have been to bars. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we just need to consider. So I'd like to, you know, make some suggestions or if you guys have ideas. And I would say that we're not going back to covert, COVID, um, you know, uh, the sector specific mandates like what we did. Um, but I think I'd like to talk about um, some different options. So are there any questions at this point? And one thing, so if you say they were, they're thinking of resuming asymptomatic testing, so are all of these cases actually symptomatic to some degree? I don't have that information. I can tell you that it seems like people are using this term to a degree called PAM, pre-symptomatic, asymptomatic, or mildly symptomatic. Because it's just hard. If you say to someone, so I've heard people said, I've had no symptoms. And then you speak with them for a little while. They're, they're like, well, I didn't have symptoms, but the next day I did get a sore throat and a cough. And it's not that they're trying to skirt the issue. I just think you know a prompt um, gets them thinking about that. So I don't know what UMass is going to be doing, um, but I, I, I suspect they'll make some decisions. Soon. And is UMass doing regular, they're not doing regular testing the way Amherst College is, which is they're testing every student twice a week, no matter what. That, that's my understanding. If you're unvaccinated, you're tested twice a week. If you're vaccinated, um, they, they have it available and it's been taken up by quite a lot of people. Um, I know and I thank, you know, the students that didn't feel well and got tested, but there's no, to my understanding, uh, weekly asymptomatic testing. You know, last year when they had people on campus, I don't know how many students were on campus, you know, was it 5,000? I just don't know. Now that they have 30,000, you know, can they, can they do it? You know, it would be some ramping up for sure. And I don't know what they'll come up with. Yeah. No, um, Jen, what about um, bars having, not having people standing at the bar, having masks and, and having um, a six feet spacing? What are your thoughts on, on that? I, I, yeah, thanks, Nancy. I think that's the direction we need to go. I think um, it's a good idea for a few reasons. And I would say it, if we decide to do that, let's do it for a little while and then we'll review. So I think if we do that, and again, this isn't COVID spacing, it's not gonna be like that. So if people, if our um, uh, amendment is that masks can come off when eating or drinking when seated, 
-hmm. I think that would be a way that we can really um, help uh, people can help police the numbers, not police, that's not the right number, but, you know, make sure that the numbers are right. You can see who's going in and who's coming out. Usually if you're seated, you would be with your known group. Um, and also um, there's less chance of random contact. Um, I think if people are standing and drinking, even the most well-meaning person who's just doing it, you know, there's more moving around um, and and we saw some spread. So that would be my recommendation is uh, to, do, to do that. I don't know how people feel about that. It's something um, that would need to be thought about. Um, uh, I know Ed Smith is here. I don't know if he wants to speak up, but you know, it, it would be um, having people seated, um, you know, how are tables arranged? Well, you know, there's code and there's fire code. So I know, you know, the owners aren't going to, you know, go out and rent, you know, lots of tables and put them in. People can't be packed in there. They'll be separated to a point, um, but it's not going to be COVID spacing. And I don't know if I answered your question. I'm sorry. Um, but then at the bar, that's something to consider. Um, what do we do? Because if you're seated at the bar, you can be back to back with somebody. So are people spread out at the bar um, between party and party? Um, Ed, I'm going to allow you to talk. I don't know if you want to. Ed Smith is one of our um, inspectors. Whoop. I gave it to somebody else. Uh, uh. Oh. Ed, are you there? Ed, are you there? I think he's muted. Hello. There. Hi, Ed. And then Hi. the receipt will have you after Ed. Okay. And I don't, I don't know if you have anything to add, um, but you know, if this is the way we go, you know, I just don't know if you have anything to add to, you know, supporting, you know, our owners um, with this uh, change. Sure. Um, Rob Moore, the building commissioner, and I had a chance to talk this afternoon about, you know, the effects and what would be the likely responses. Um, you know, I think it's very natural that if you restrict um, people to be unmasked only when they're seated, um, that they'll ask to put in as many tables as is possible. Um, and I went over some of those numbers with Jen. And I'm, I'm sorry, I, I jumped out and came back in. I'm not sure if you reviewed those numbers. Um, you know, it, it could, in one, in one of the major establishments, it would have a diminishment of about 20% of the capacity from what it is now. Capacity right now is full capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and it, that 20% diminishment might be manipulated up a little bit, you know, as, you know, naturally the owners react and try to preserve as much of their income as they can, you know, um, and we certainly want to support them as businesses, but we also don't want to dig too deep a hole for ourselves anywhere in the community. Um, so it would be natural for them to react. Some, some businesses have more open floor space where they're more flexible about reacting to a change in the ordinance. Um, a business, um, some of the smaller bars don't have the, the flexibility, say, that bigger institutions, uh, you know, and I'll mention like, say, the hangar and the spoke that have more floor space. Um, there would be a little more nimble with any regulation that you propose. You know, I'll just I'll just add, I've been talking to um, many of the, uh, or, or several of the owners, They've been so good to, to work with. They really want to, you know, do right um, about, you know, making sure that spread is, you know, minimized. Um, and I, I know they, they realize this is, you know, sort of a, a hard time, but they've been really, really good to work with. Um, so I just want to give them a lot of credit. Um, yeah, and as hard as it's been for them to maintain their staff, if the numbers are rising, I mean, the steps that you're considering are 
largely protecting their staff as well. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know, that it's, I assume it's protected information about whether any of the restaurants and bars staff suffered um, recently. Um, yeah. But you know, <clears throat> we need to protect them. Yeah. Um, okay, if I let Rasif sure. speak. Yeah. Okay. Let Rasif in. Mm -hmm. Hi, Rasif. Are you there? I think you're muted. I don't know if that's me. Let me see. Okay. Yes. Good evening. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for letting me speak and uh, you know meeting meeting today and doing what you're doing to keep our uh, community safe. Uh, I thought that you might like to hear from a, a, a business owner. Um, you know, yeah. who, and, and Jen, by the way, thank you for working with us and uh, trying to find something that works for everyone. Um, so, you know, in, in and and I your concern and your consideration is very much appreciated because you know measures of course they will they will affect our business you know um whether it's uh, being uh, everyone required to be seated uh capacity limits you know they will in inevitably restrict business after what has already been a very long um you know 18 months and um so what i um would ask is uh our measures being um, considered along with uh, the, the health cost in terms of what do cases, arise in cases mean now versus arise in cases a year ago. Um, so, you know, if arise in cases a year ago meant uh, 100 rise in cases meant 20 hospitalizations, um, what, what do that 100 rise in cases mean now in terms of how many people are being hospitalized um, and how, how it is affecting uh, people's health and um, yeah, and the community's health. Um, yeah. Because from, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm no um, ex health expert and that's why you're here, Jen, is, uh, you know, when people are vaccinated, uh, you know, it, it seems that it's not um, as serious as it was when they were not vaccinated. And of course, mm -hmm. there are still many, many people that are still unvaccinated and uh, what responsibility we have as a community or as businesses um, uh, in terms of shutting down our business or reducing our business or reducing our income to protect those um, that are choosing not to be vaccinated at this time. Um, and of course, I know there's, there's others that are vaccinated and you know, immunocompromised and, and their health, of course, should also be considered. So you know, that, is, that is what I ask. I will plainly say that you know, if, seated mask requirement or, 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 or uh, capacity requirements, if these things are, are going into place, that it is, yes, bars, um, uh, uh, places that, that, you, that you know, depend on a certain number of people coming in, we will be the ones that will primarily be affected. I would ask that, you know, that the board work somewhat with the town because we still have to pay 100% of our liquor license fees and all the other fees that we have to pay to stay in business along with taxes and uh, uh, the rent and all that, that there may be some consideration there um, uh, along with uh, decisions that will uh, uh, reduce, reduce our income. That's a good question. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you. I'm concerned about the 12 and under population that can't be vaccinated yet and what effect it might have on them if it if it starts rising in the community is it okay to um let peter in yes hi everybody can you hear me yes yes hi uh yeah my name is peter and i'm a uh, i'm an amherst resident um i also work at umass um uh, just prefer to see my first name for the public meeting, but I can uh, I can That's email right. one of, I can email one of you if you want to get my last name down for the meeting it, minutes fine. later. It's okay, it's thank you. Um, yeah, I, I know Jennifer knows who I am too. We've been in I contact. Know. Okay, great. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so first of all, yeah, I wanted to say I think yeah, there's been a lot of good things in terms of what the town has done for the mask mandate, which is which is great. Um, you know, the compliance seems pretty good with that, um, and I'm really glad that you know that um that you all jumped on board with that last uh, month, you know, to get ahead of this. Um, 
I had, sorry, so I'll try to order my thoughts. I just had a few recommendations for what I, I think we can do uh, as, as the town um, to, to, you know, to curb this. Um, you know, first of all, yeah, I mean, I do think it's a good idea to have more regulations uh, uh, at the bars, but, at, in, in, you know, because I, um, because I understand that's where a lot of like densely packed events take place. Um, at the same time, though, uh, sort of you know echoing the sentiment um, that the that I, I think his name was Recife, who was just speaking, um, sort of echoing that sentiment. Though I certainly wouldn't want there to be a measure where where these are the only people who are sort of bearing the brunt of you know the measures, right? And I think that with that being said, I think that what we can do, what the Board of Health can do. Uh, and I know it's not their decision ultimately, but is to come to an agreement and to really pressure the university to pressure UMass, uh, you know, an institution which, of course, has a lot more resources than, you know, than small local businesses, right? Um, millions more dollars, right? Um, to really pressure them to ramp up their asymptomatic testing, right? Because that covers a lot of people and they do have the resources to do that. Um, and, you know, the, it, the, that way, if they're doing that, that's that's if they're doing that, if they're doing that more consistently, that's going to prevent these situations where then you have uh, local businesses that have to take certain measures. And, you know, I understand that that, you know, some of them may, that we may have to take those measures temporarily, but really, you know, pressuring pressuring UMass to do more asymptomatic testing, I think, is going to go a long way because it deals with that second problem, too, if that makes sense. Right. Um because, you know, the problem is they're just not testing enough people, and that's a huge population. Um, so I think that's the one thing I, I think that should be done. Uh, and, if, and, you know, in addition to some of some of the regulations, uh, and not, not being too punitive, but some regulations about like seating, right? But, but I definitely don't think that should be the thing, the only thing that should be done by itself. Um, and then another, another aspect in cons of concern is, uh, is outdoor events. Um, and again, this this is sort of more on UMass because they're they're the ones who are going to hold the most events that are going to be very large packed events, right? I think like the average attendance of football games are like ten thousand people, or I, I don't know what it is. Like I was looking at some number from twenty fifteen. You know, I know it's not, I know it's not University of Michigan or something, but it's still a lot. It's still a lot of people that and, and really and a really uh, densely packed area, right? Um, so, you know, what the town could do is have an outdoor mask mandate that covers large events. Um, and I don't know if that would, would regulate UMass, uh, but at the very least, it would set an example for them and to say, hey, you know, you should really be doing this too. We're taking the measures. We're taking the measures. We're trying to be careful. Do your part as well. Um, so I'd say those are like the three major things, if that's clear enough. And I'm, I'm happy to repeat any of them too. But th those are my three recommendations as a town resident of how we can get a hold of this. Um, and I do understand uh, that Jennifer has been in touch and working with with um, uh, you know with UMass as well. And I that's that's fantastic. And I just think it would it would send you know I think it'd be a strong message of the Board of Health. You know, a, a, had a couple agreements. Um, on some of these issues and then, you know, communicated this to the university, basically, again, saying, you know, you need to be doing your part. We shouldn't be bearing, bearing the brunt of this alone. Mm. Yeah, you know, thank you, Peter. I, I know I will sort of just echo what I said is it, it, I agree with you. It's a real community response. We're really working with UMass and they're, they're just figuring out what they can do. And they, they're very aware they have a big football game coming up and what measures are they going to take? Um, we, you know, a few years, uh, weeks back, we, you know, asked for masking outdoors for the Rotary Club Fair, and we um, didn't have any transmission there. You know, it's just not documented outside. Um, you know, I just, there might be some cases of it um, that I'm, you know, Sturgis Motorcycle Rally, and there's some others probably. I don't know about Barnstable County. I just don't have that information. You know, it was going to be something we were going to talk about with the bid block party, but now that points uh, move. So, anyhow, I just wanted to say we 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 are doing sort of uh, an approach together to look at every everything. So, thank you. Anyone Rene, else? Does he have his hand back up? I think that's it. Yeah. Rasif, do you want to talk again? Should we? Uh... Wait a minute. 
Did I? Oops. Sorry, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to have my hand back up, but I'm here. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm <laughs> okay. Sorry. Uh, That's you fine. Know, um, if anyone has questions, uh, 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 I'm here. Um, and I, I was wondering, I'm sorry if I missed this part of the meeting. I, I jumped in 15 minutes late. What is the incidence or positivity rate for those under 12? Under 12? Um, we've had a few cases. I don't, I don't know the answer, Peter. We've had just a few cases, yeah. But, but we've had four-year-olds, you know, sick. Um, the school has a dashboard. There's been um, seven cases, um, uh, I believe, in the school system, if I'm reading their dashboard correctly. So I'm sorry, I don't have that number. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, I know that the board has a decision or, or two to make either this week or next week. Um, I would, um, you know, uh, ask you to consider uh, that uh, before putting on capacity restrictions or other restrictions that, you know, alternative, alternative choices may be considered, whether it's, you know, uh, allowing maybe uh, if it's uh, students in, in crowded situations that people are concerned about uh, maybe uh, whether it's checking vaccination records or uh, you, you know, making sure that people who are in crowded spaces have, uh, are, are vaccinated, you know, uh, it's around here. I know some other business owners in other towns have had a, a bad reaction to that sort of thing. But if I have to choose between shutting down a, a part of my business, uh, losing income or checking people's vaccination records for a certain part of it, I, I would I would definitely uh, choose the latter, um, mm. but just just something something to consider. Uh, uh, mm. Thank you thank you again for uh, listening to me today. Yeah, thanks, Chrissy. That's something we have discussed, sort of, um, you know, and, and maybe we'll we'll focus on that at some point. Peter, do you have your hand up again? Let me yeah, we should move on because we, you know people we should have three minutes to speak really, and so I think we need to move on. We're going to be here a long okay. time. Okay. So what do we think? Adding um, an amendment, is it something we should vote on or is it something that I would do? Um, but what do, does the board wanna do if we add masks, person that exception to mask be persons at a restaurant, bar or venue when seated while eating or drinking? So, uh at our last meeting, Jen, you, you clearly said um, this was going to be data driven and we have data going yeah. up. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. With some reports that from the contact tracers that this is part of the activities that yeah. they're hearing about. Yeah. Um, I'm sure some of its parties too. So Right. And I guess yeah. it's things won't move to parties if it gets to be not as much fun at the bars too, but- Right, um, we don't wanna do that, push right. people into cars, you know, and drive yeah. in, so. Um, but. And I know we actually started with that as our, our mm -hmm. uh, recommendation last, month and then backed away from it a little bit. Um, maybe it is time to just do this much and see if that makes any any changes. So is it masks or is it checking vaccination status? Because I know in New York City to enter restaurant or bar, you have to have, have be vaccinated. That isn't part of our um, toolkit right now. Presumably, Jen, a great many of the, the current increase is among vaccinated people. Yeah. 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 And the assumption is that, you know, a huge uh, majority of the people in the age group that we're talking about are have had to be vaccinated. By, yes. uh, they're, they're contracting and students. transmitting. Um, we do have a, a question have another... or a comment. Is that okay if I let them in? Yeah. Yes. I just three minutes. We end up. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for joining us. Can you tell us your name in, in three minutes? It's gastronomy. Huh? 
gastronomy. Mm -hmm. Hello. Your hand is up and you're permitted to talk. Muted. Oh, unmuted. Ask to unmute. I don't know. I don't. Yeah, unmuted. It's unmuted. Yeah. Gastronomy, can you hear us? Oh. Right, well, I guess he or she does not want to speak. Okay. They disappeared. Okay. Okay. So Jen, what action would you like to take? Well, this is this is a big step, and I I'd like to you know hear what the board has to say. If this is the way we want to go, um, I don't know if this is something that you can continue to say you support this, and I can and word it, or would you like to help word or vote? What is the best best next step? Jen, what is your, what is your response, Steve? What, what, what is your response to Ed Smith's comment that uh, that rule, if it's implemented to the max in many places, will not greatly reduce the density of people? Yeah, yeah. So um, I think what I really like about this is some of the things that you know I had mentioned. I really think people are seated, they're in their party, um, and they're, they're not apt to turn around and say, oh, you know, there's my buddy um, and walk away. So I think it's staying within your party. Um, and like I said, sort of less random contact with people. Um, I don't want to make it so sparse, like we had said, I don't want it going back to like COVID standards. Um, but I think this is a really good way to control the number of people. I like to see the volume of the music turned down too, but that's something else. Yeah, because people have to speak and yeah. project yeah. Uh, louder, yeah. which means more things come out of your mouth. <laughs> yeah. Tim, Maureen? I would support going in this direction and monitoring things. Um, like I said, I don't know that this will have a huge effect and I hope it won't too seriously impact the owners, but I, mm -hmm. I think it's probably something we should do. Mm -hmm. I also wondered about, and I can't remember what the public schools or other sporting kinds of activities about, I know they're outside, but where people are kind of packed together, like, and shouting, um, yeah. like yeah. the stands or like the, sidelines of a game or mm -hmm. um, something on that order. And I don't know if there, you've had any reports of any kind of, uh, of uh, transmission in that kind of setting, but it makes you think about it. Um, it does, Maureen, I'm sorry, were you done? I don't want to- Yeah, I'm done. Yeah. Um, and this is something that North and Northampton has is they have a mask order um, for um, outdoor spaces and such activities, like you said, where people are sort of in a denser situation and can't keep that social or that six feet physical distancing. Um, but like benches, like you said, um, of a dugout or something, we have not seen any transmission um, here. They may have very different patterns there. Um, we had one um, a person who was positive on a team. Um, it was outdoors and just no transmission. So feel very comfortable with that now. So, okay. yeah. Tim? What do you, oh, excuse me. Uh, I, I think uh, we should wait for what UMass is going to come up with in terms of a response. Uh, looks like it's at the age group of 21. 
um, mm-hmm. and it has to be a coordinated a coordinated effort even if we put uh, efforts at the downtown level we need to know what is the uh, ums policy related to this increased cases you know so um, of course you know we uh, i think i'm 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 also concerned with the business impacts of the downtown having large losses in the past several months the new students coming in and you know of course we could provide guidance on some sort of a densities not a, you know in terms of the closed lines you know if if the lines <laughs> to some establishments or people are standing very close you know providing that type of guidances along with if you're standing in a line have a mask or something but i'm thinking it the any f in any effort it has to be coordinated with what ums comes up with as a policy change ums has an indoor mask policy yeah so we're talking about an indoor mask policy peter has his hand up again um you know what tom walsh is has his hand up can we can i let oh, yeah. him in mm-hmm. Did you let him in? I, I missed yes. Tom. Oh yeah. yeah, are you in Tom? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi Tom. Hey, how is everyone? Thanks for doing this. Um, sorry, that was me as gastronomy, but for some reason it wouldn't oh. let me sign in. So oh. I had to resign in. So okay. uh, just a couple things, I'll make it real quick. Um, I've definitely got some concerns as we all do with the rise of numbers, especially since we had zero cases in, uh, was it June and July? And then when leases were signed, August 3rd, we jumped to three. And by your first meeting on the 11th, we were at 18 cases. So I definitely have concerns where uh, residents and business owners are gonna bear the brunt of us bringing back the 28,000 plus kids and, and people from university. So I definitely think that before we start to really make decisions that are gonna affect uh, people's financial well-being and their ability to make a livelihood and support their families, we really need to put some pressure on the university. Um, you know, it is, this is a problem with the students. You guys have already said that the common age is 21 plus and mostly students, right? Mm-hmm. So that being said, like I, I run a, a blue collar establishment and I know Rasif runs a restaurant. And so if these go into, into place and we're, we're left to, uh, of these mandates and it affects everyone across the board then i think that we really need to start looking at you know how how are we gonna how are we gonna go forward you know we're looking at almost two years with mandates and and, and you know even though things were light, you know lessened last july it didn't mean that people came back out and patronized us and as well the house parties that were adjacent caused massive damage to me while no one could do anything to curtail it not the property owner. The police are not in, in place to be mask police. They're not doing that. They're called for noise complaints, disorderly, violence. It's not, they're not the COVID police. So how, how do we as a community say, well, you got a house party that has 300 kids, but if no one's calling on them and there's no complaint, all we can do is break it up. If, we, if, if you don't let them in the bars, they're just going to, they're going to congregate somewhere else. They're kids. That's what they'll do. I mean, so how do we address that problem? Because the last year when the bars were closed, we had a massive spread and we all know how it happened. It was house parties because they had no bar to go to. So, I mean, I just, I think we really need to address the student body in a, in a, in a sense where it's like, if that's where the majority of the, of, of the cases are popping up, then that's what we should focus on. Before we start handing down mandates for restaurants, I mean, I don't have any students in my restaurant right now. I'm sitting in my office. There's not one student in here, but if, if you were to make a decision that changed that, then it would be taking people out of my seats and I've already suffered greatly. You know, and I'm, I'm for community first, don't get me wrong. I wanna protect the businesses and the residents. You know, the students come in and a, a large portion of businesses depend on it, but you know, it's not, it's not the mainstay of our, of our diet. We're here year round. The students essentially are here five months and of the five months, we might see three, three and a half months of business out of them between the breaks and everything else. So I would just ask that you please consider um, year-round businesses that are affected by this and the fact that it, with the influx of the students returning, that's when our spike happened. 
I, That's all. Thank you. I have a question for you, Carla. How does wearing a mask, unless you're seated, affect your business? It affects because there's a, a proportion of people that are, re, are resistant to that. I mean, you guys also mentioned possibly having uh, vaccination cards. Th those are going to affect people's businesses. You know, I mean, I, I just I, I don't think that any time in history, if we look back where you had to show papers to do something, it was a productive move or looked upon as so. So I, I know that things are changing constantly and that I might just be stuck in my mindset, but I think that those are drastic measures, especially since, you know, I came in late because I was driving and I heard that the average age was 21 to, was it 25? Yes. You know? And I, I think when we spoke before, Jen, I was saying, I wish that the UMass and CVS and local testing would uh, add some criteria to their tests so that you can find out if it was asymptomatic, travel, actually ill, hopefully not hospitalized, student or non-student, and vaccinated or non-vaxxed, so that we could actually gather the information and make informed decisions on what's actually going on. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. What steps would you like to take, board? I'd like to just understand. So if it has risen so drastically just within the next last few days, what are the prospects of a really explosive growth that then goes into the community and you're going to affect public schools, everything else? I mean, it seems like the situation is pretty unstable right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. In other words, if we just say, oh, well, let's wait till UMass does something, I, we could be, we could have a situation that's really out of control. We have a unique population. It's not the fault of any restaurateur or bar owner, but the population here is what it is. And it's different from just about really from any other municipality in the Commonwealth. And so that is it something we live with, which benefits us in many ways, but if it's gonna be the, the, the source of a truly catastrophic outbreak, it seems like we should be trying to do everything we can to prevent it right from the beginning before, before it gets out of control. Or Jen, is that an unrealistic scenario? No, this is what, the, what keeps me up at night, you know, thinking about this. I don't want any students sick, you know, anyone in our town, but I think about, you know, how it might spread out. I don't want to say transmit because that's like a mechanism, the spread. And it, it, it you know, I can see, I, I see the contact tracing. There's one or two things that will be connect that have been connected, I believe. And we just, this is the time now to do it, I believe. And like Nancy said, you know, these people that have these vulnerable populations that have not been uh, vaccinated. You know, and I think the R not, you know, if we start talking about that is, you know, before Delta was like 1.3. So every one person infected 1.3. So there's still growth. So now, you know, that leaked CDC document. So the Delta, the R not is like seven to eight. I mean, cause so we could really see it take off, but I, I can't say if that's true or not. So that's just a anecdotal. Mm -hmm. And there's another variant leaking away. Yeah. The the M M O or M U one. Mu. The mu. mu. Um. Wine? No, I don't know. I mean, I I think I said what I I thought earlier. So I I feel like we probably should do something now. I I realize how hard this is. It's probably a minor effect, but is there any way that the town can hold off on the license fees and things like that? Because that is, that's not fair that people have yeah. to pay a full license fee when they can't operate their mm -hmm. business completely. I, it probably won't make a big difference, but it is something. Yeah, yeah I, I wrote heard. that wrote that down. I think Rossi, that made, it was a good point he made, if it's anything that we can do to help. 
I can look into that. That's I wrote that down. So should we? I also want to mention uh, it's the end of second week of classes. Semester started. I mean, it's it's not coincidental. <laughs> it's a, a huge student body coming in, you know, population coming in. Um, and I'm just, I'm just, the, why I was mentioning some sort of a coordination with UMass is, of course, we can go ahead and <laughs> add some regulations here, but the primary uh, issue is also, the, you know, has to be dealt with, you know, student bodies, you know, so that's why I was saying it has to be coordinated some way. Yeah. Um, there are two people with uh, raised hands. Yeah, I was gonna, Do we have time uh, to continue? Or? Yep. So there's Wait. Chad, Chad, and Mindy. And then we'll have to keep going Is that yeah. after this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's go with Chad, and then we'll we'll get Mindy in. All right. So Chad, I think you should be able to speak. And then that will be it. Chad, are you there? He's muted. He's muted here, let's see. Is he unmuted now? Can there. you hear me? Okay, Chad. Yes. Uh, this is Kara, Chad's wife. Hi, he, I'm just on his phone in here. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi. What is yes. Your, what, would you tell us your name just for the minutes? What's your name? Kara Fabry, I'm Chad's okay. wife, the owner of the spoke. Hi. Hi. So. I've just been listening in. I'm actually on shift right now. And my question to you guys is, I know it's been, as Tommy was saying, it's been a, a very, very long, almost two years for us as business owners in Amherst, as obviously everybody is feeling it right now. But my question with these students just coming back is, I, I feel the same way as Tommy feels. We There needs to be something done about the house parties, the you know, the congregations, I know the tailgate was just closed tomorrow, you know, these kind of things, I feel like us local businesses are being punished for things students are doing that nobody can really keep an eye on. And it really affects us. I mean, we've sat without an income for a year and a half with a family to feed and bills to pay. And I feel like there has to be some other result to shutting us down and, um, making all these rules that are undesirable for students to come out the more they come to establishments that are regulated is more that they are pulled away from unregulated parties and we all know that there's i mean it's all over social media there's 300 plus people's pe students congregating and partying and nothing's being done about it but yet local businesses are being punished there has to be some sort of happy medium here Hello. Okay. I can't hear you. Sorry, I can't tell if anybody can hear me, Chad. Yes, yeah. we, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, sorry, I'm on a Samsung phone. I'm used to Apple and I have no idea how to work this thing right now. Okay. <laughs> Are you finished? And then we'll. So I, I guess my question is, is you know, um, if if things are going to go into effect, who's going to stop these house parties? Who's going to stop the regulation of other things? And why aren't the people the town believes to be the spreaders of this being punished, but yet the businesses are? Because I, I've, I've honestly sat quiet for a very long time, but it's now quite literally affecting the way I raise my children. We are, there, ha there has to be a happy medium. And I'm not saying that the virus isn't real, the virus isn't spreading, and we should just have a free for all. That's not at all what I'm saying. I'm saying that there has to be some sort of happy medium here. You can't punish one and let the other roam free. I guess that's my input on it. I mean, for what it's worth at all, but it's, um, there seems to be a lot of people that are, you know, we want to see our businesses do well and we want to see Amherst be a, a, you know, an attraction for people. Well, businesses are literally dropping one by one that are never going to reopen in this town and pretty soon there's going to be no attraction whatsoever if we don't do something 
And again, I'm not saying to let a free for all out happen. I'm saying that there has to be, we've got to meet in the middle here. There has to be something that we can do to still all be successful and still squash it. You know, all these students are vaccinated yet, you know, especially in my establishment, I'm heavily populated, probably 80% student, 20%, you know, any other age group. And they're all vaccinated, yet we're seeming to have these crazy outbreaks. So is it the students? Is it not? What What is going on? Like Tommy was saying that there has to, can we figure out some trace contact? Are they asymptomatic? Are they, what age group are they? You know, if they're all proven to be of an older age group and not student population, maybe we require, you know, some sort of documentation. I'm not sure, but Mm -hmm. I guess I'm here not for answers right now. I'm just here to put my two cents in. And it's that it's, it's quite literally affecting every business in town. It's affecting the way, you know, I know probably nobody gives a shit, but it's, we can barely afford to raise our children at this point because there's no income for a year and a half or living off savings account. I mean, how many other businesses have to close their doors for the town to see that there needs to be something else done? And it's not, the, the answer isn't making businesses shut down. There, there's got to be something within the student population that has to happen. But. Thank you. Thank you. It's very difficult. Well, it, it is very difficult. And unfortunately, the people making decisions aren't sitting in the shoes of all these people who are reaping the, the consequences of it. And that goes with everybody getting COVID too. There's the, the people, you know, I'm going to assume that we all are assuming that the uh, student population is the one that's making this outbreak right now happen, which maybe is a good assumption, but if we can put our finger on it, if we can find a way to do that, then maybe we can have some better ideas in place to move forward with regulations, but just, just you know, faulting businesses that are open in a student community isn't, I feel is not the right way to go. We're the ones being punished for other people's behaviors that we can't control. So maybe as a town and as a community, we come together and try to find a way to control that. Thank you. We're gonna go on to me. I mean, we're we're going to continue following the policies that the town has in place right now. That's what we have to do until I'm told otherwise, but I actually am on shift right now. So I'm going to go back on because I can't find help right now. So I'm working doubles every single day just to mm -hmm. try to keep my doors open. So you guys have a good day. That's about Thank all you. I have to say. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, Mindy, let's see. Yeah. Up. All right, I think I Where's think we have Mindy. Are okay. you there? Yes. Yeah, there you are. Okay, yes. Mindy. Hi, everybody. Um, Hi, Mindy. So first of all, I just want to thank you. That's my main comment for the evening is I want to thank you for your incredible public service and hard work and thoughtfulness. Um, to the public board members and to Jen for stepping into this role during this intense time. So thank you so much. I wanna um, let you know that uh, Senator Comerford and I at an earlier meeting today, we've already discussed sort of exploring additional state resources and capacity to increase community testing in Amherst. Mm -hmm. so, you know, if you're aware, but the, you know, the state shrunk their network of community test sites throughout the Commonwealth. I think Jen knows this. And oh. um, Hampshire County actually is a testing desert, even though Amherst, because we have UMass community testing, isn't. But we're going to explore seeing if we can increase the capacity for community testing um, at UMass Amherst right now so that we at least can make sure that the community has access to it. We're also going to explore some of the issues that have been raised about um, testing in the university campus, which I think is gonna be more complicated, but we'll advocate and explore that. Yeah. I did feel the need, and I hope this is okay. This is just my background as a health educator, really makes me wanna say that when we're thinking about regulations around reducing community spread, we have to think about both 
the transmission piece and what happens as a result of transmission. So like the mask prevents infection. It prevents the virus from going from one person to another. But when the virus is able to get through the mask, the vaccine is taking care of what your body, how your body experiences that infection. Do you know what I'm saying? So the two act um, complementary, but differently. So if we're looking to reduce spread with a highly vaccinated population, which we have, um, at least on the campus, I'm not sure about in the community how highly vaccinated we are, but I think we're pretty um, vaccinated. I would encourage you to think about masks because that's what's going to try, masks that are properly worn, obviously, that's going to try to, um, that will reduce the virus's transmission from one person to another. And if we're thinking we're at the beginning or in the middle of an outbreak, that's definitely one piece of the puzzle. And it sounds to me like the business owners who have spoken and spoken, I think, really poignantly about the impact um, of regulations on their businesses have not said we don't want masks. You know, they're saying we don't want to be closed down, but they're not saying we don't want masks. And I think that's incredible. And um, to, I'll be honest with you, just, I think that's very um, big minded of be, to be able to say, we'll take the regulations that will allow pe our workplace to be safer, um, just don't close us down. And I, I so appreciate that, uh, that they said that. But I do think that it's important to remember that the two act differently. And the reason why I bring that up is because when we were talking about masks in schools and the governor was refusing to make a statewide mandate on masks, and he was saying, well, it's all about the vaccine. It wasn't all about the vaccine because the vaccine doesn't necessarily prevent people from, from the virus from going from person to person. The mask is gonna help us do that. And the two really, I'm putting my hands together, you can't see me, but they really sort of work together. Um, so I, I really, but my main reason for kind of butting in on this meeting, because I obviously have nothing to say about it, it's your decision is to thank you for for volunteering to be in this role and to look out for the health of our community and to be um, very fair-minded about it and to be able to think about the college campus population is part of our community and it is part of what makes our community special and it is part of what makes our businesses succeed. Um, but we also have families and communities and lots of people under the age of 12 who are not able to be vaccinated. So the outbreaks, I agree with you, Nancy, they sort of raise a red, they sort of make us more concerned for the people who are more vulnerable. And so. as you said, it's the layering, it's the masks, it's the, yes. a little bit less density, right. it's the vaccine, it, 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 it's everything that we do together. Right. But, um, it's everything we do together. I think that's a really good way of looking at it. And it can also be like, you know, so do we ask people to wear masks more in indoor spaces? You know, do we ask, um, do we ask people to wear them in outdoor spaces? And I'm, I, I guess I also wanna make sure that you know that I'm here to be not just a resource to the board and to Jen, I hope you know that also Jen, but also if you mm -hmm. think we need more resources to do something from the state, please do not hesitate to ask um, or to demand. Um, and I will take that and work with Senator Cumberford to advocate for those resources. So, um, even if you're thinking of something out of the box, which I don't think there is much out of the box at this point, but it needs more additional resources, you should feel free to say, we wish we could do X, Y, or Z, but we just don't have the resources, can the state help? But that's what I mean. I'm, we're gonna look to try to increase at least the community testing piece so that our community can always access testing. Um, and we'll also explore conversations with UMass. I'm also happy to answer any questions, but I hope you don't mind me inserting my little health education piece in there. Thank you, Mindy. Thank you. Much. Yeah. Thank you so much for your work. Okay, okay. here we are. We yeah. gotta do something. So, Jen, repeat your question of, of where you want the guidance. So I'd like to hear from the board as I, as I have, but just if, if we're gonna go forward with um, the, the clause of putting in that people must be seated while eating and drinking if a mask is gonna come off. Um, so I think I, do I understand where everyone sits with that? 
Is it something that we want to word together? Is it something that I can word? Those are my two questions, I guess. Are we moving forward with this? And if we are, do you want me to, to write it? You give me the okay. I'm comfortable with masks um, unless you're seated. And I'm comfortable with your wording it. Steve? I agree, yeah. Okay. We should I, agree. Have I agree too. Tim? Yeah, I agree. Um, I am going to have some one question for you. We have to have a, we should have a motion though. Yeah, so we, we have, on record have a motion that. and we have to vote on it. So, yeah. Um, who would like to make the motion? Maureen, do you want to make? I'll a motion? make a motion that we will amend our mass indoor mask requirement to include masks need to be on unless seated while eating or drinking. And it established. I don't know if I got that right, but you know, no, you got it right. Yeah. Second, and uh, need someone to second it. I'll second it. Okay, Maureen. Aye. But now wait. Let me make sure because this is pretty important. I want to make sure we're saying the right thing here. So now we're also saying that Jen is going to put the wording in, right? right. Yes. Yeah. So we're <clears throat> we're saying mask will be required. Um, indoors in, in, except whilst eating and drinking while seated, seated. At, at a restaurant or bar i don't know they yeah it, the way it's worded is um exceptions like number four mm -hmm. exceptions this order shall not apply to persons at a restaurant bar or venue when seated while eating or drinking that's an exemption exception to the requirement. Yes. Yes. The, the, of the indoor mask requirement. That's yes, how we yes. wrote it That's initially. We... Oh, last time, last meeting. Yes. And so now we are. Then it got amended after that. Jen, we may send us an updated copy that took that okay. exception out, and we're putting oh, that yes. exception so back we're putting in. Putting it back in. Say it. Say it one more time, please. Then. What's the actual motion? Just let me make sure because, you know, what's the motion? Oh, um, <laughs> so the motion is that we, our indoor mask mandate will include an exception to allow people to uh, remove the mask while eating or drinking while seated in a bar or restaurant or, or a venue or venue or venue because it, that might include a wedding or right whatever. right and <clears throat> Jen, jennifer will authorize jennifer to uh put that into writing <clears throat> okay, so there, the exception is that patrons can remove a mask, patrons in a, a restaurant or bar. Or venue. That means whatever venue is, okay. okay but there, the exception is they can remove the mask while seated and eating or drinking. Okay. Second. I'll second it. Did you have something to say, Jen, before we vote? Um, there's one more person with a question, or are we moving on since we've- I think we've got to just do okay. this. I mean, I think we've heard everybody. Yeah. OK. All right, so I'll write that up um, for tomorrow. Do that in the morning. Wait a minute, we have to vote. We have to vote. All in oh. favor? Tim? Aye. Steve? Aye. Maureen? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Thank you. Okay. okay. Well, we're almost at seven o'clock and we need so, so much more to do. We need to go back is... Lenore is here. Lenore here. Let's see, where is Lenore? I don't... 
Lenore is down at the bottom. Lenore, uh, are you? There it is. <laughs> well, well, before we start a comment, like, what exactly are we talking about here? And then we'll have a short comment. So we're going back up to the uh, House Bill uh, 926, an act relative to improving uh, pesticide protection for Massachusetts school children. And Lenore, we have the letter from Lenore. We have the policy mandate that's uh, the status. It's referred to that joint committee. We have our 2000 toxic chemical, and we have the comment from Michael Morse that they adhere to the regulations that are in existence now. So should we have Lenore speak? And the question is whether we would support this. Support. Like let the state, like, Rep, our representatives know that we support this measure. Yes. So, Lenore. Whoops. Oh, there she is. Ah, here we go. Ah, Lenore. Okay. I'm allowed to talk. Yes. Are you? Okay. Yes. Hi, guys. Hi. All right. I, I want to echo what Mindy said, thanking you for your good work. I'm always impressed when I sit in on a meeting, always. And I'm not that easily impressed. Um, so uh, I'm not sure who got to read what, or if you have questions or you know how to do this in the most efficient, quick way. I, I sent a bunch, a bunch more stuff today to you mm -hmm. all. So I, I didn't expect you to read it. I just want you to have it in hand. Um, because we have been speaking to boards of health and, and school committees. And when questions come up, I'm just gathering responses so that we can be ready if you have the same questions. So I looked at the bill or, or the, the, um, the act. Um, And um, I, I support it. I don't know, did other people read it? Yes. Questions, comments, thoughts? I mean, it seems like a very good idea. You know, if, if, the, if the schools, brought up anything. If they say, oh, this is going to detract from people's education because now we're going to have to spend a fortune on pest on getting rid of weeds, then we might be concerned. But they're not saying that. They're able to deal with it, the situation now, which is not all that different. So it does seem like this is a good idea to support. And, and can I just speak to that very briefly, Stephen, is that Amherst is sort of a no-brainer because we're kind of already doing it already. Um, mm -hmm. And this, in, and our support of this is really to help the, the, the rest of the communities in the Commonwealth so that, so that that understanding of the risk that we're taking um, is, we're basically, it's a, it's a moment of education and increased public awareness and increased awareness for legislators to kind of get the momentum going on this. It, it doesn't really change what we do in Amherst that much. Um, so that's, it's, it's more that our endorsement is amplifying the, the voice that's so needed um, of how very dangerous and unnecessary um, it is to do this. And there's, it's really easy to address communities that um, have concerns like the increased cost or if your fields don't look pristine, that there's very easy answers for all that. This is, it's, it's kind of a no brainer. And, and to be honest, it's the legislation with the least amount of teeth um, for this topic. I would love to see a much stricter ban, but it's easier for people to wrap their heads around our kids' um, health since they're the most vulnerable. So this is kind of the, um, you know, the poster child, so to speak, for, um, for changing the way that we uh, 
manage land with with pesticides and go to more natural alter alternatives. Mindy has her hand raised. Mindy, do you want to speak to this? Um, that's I didn't know it was still raised, but I can okay. tell, I can tell you I'm the vice chair of this joint committee. And, um, I believe that uh, there's going to be a hearing scheduled probably either this month or next month that's going to have a whole host of pesticide related bills. And that's when this will be heard. And if you take a position on this, you should definitely, I mean, I can provide you if it hasn't already been provided to you with information on where to send your support for the bill. And you should not only send it to the subcommittee, the committee, but you should send it to um, myself and Senator Comerford so that we're aware of your interest in it. I'll be, a, I'll find out through the committee since I'm vice chair, but sending us a copy of the email is a good way to make sure that we're on notice for it. Okay. So if you send us that, that would be helpful. Sure. Um, so Eleanor, you're asking us to write a letter of support for the bill. By any chance, does your committee have a draft letter? Yeah, the link, the uh, initial, I sent two emails. The initial email has a link and it's, it's, it's really easy. I think you actually just have to add, you don't have to write anything. Um, I have to look it up again because I'm working on a lot of different initiatives. Um, I think you really just add your, um, your organization, your committee. Yeah, so I, don't even, I don't even think you have to write anything. So it says organizations can endorse by clicking here. Um, yeah, that's yeah. it. Okay. That's it. It's really simple. Yeah. And if it isn't, let me know. <laughs> okay. Um, I think it's an online submission. Yes. Okay, so do we want to vote on that? Someone want to make a motion? I'll move that the Board of Health support uh, House Bill 926 on use of pesticides near schools. Second. I I'll second it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, any more discussion? Okay. All in favor? Maureen? Aye. Tim? Aye. Steve? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Okay. Now, Thank you guys. Always a pleasure working with people who are, really care about public health and really do it right. So, okay. And, and, Mindy, if you can, and Mindy, if you can hear me, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, right. do, I have a question. Do I just put, do the link and say uh, Nancy Gilbert as the Board of Health? For the board of health yeah okay and then send it to mindy and joe and joe right okay i will do that do that this evening um then i had another question for the board that within the next year should we take and re look at and review the toxic chemical regulation for town um that was uh, enacted 20 years ago. You do that already? I'd say wait. It probably makes sense to do that. It was written in a very general way to kind of use the, right. mid, the least harmful options so that didn't lock anything in, but I don't know if there's more to say about that. Okay, I can, I can take the lead on that, but I cannot do it by October. Um, I, I have too much going on and a wedding to go to and um, and stuff like that, but I could do it for November or December, unless anyone else wants to take the lead. Yeah, I have a lot in the next, I could do it also, but probably not slowly. Um, okay, so let's let's just put it on October meeting, and then we can decide how we're going to move forward to it. But we'll take action. I'll try to take a little look around. Um, yeah, I won't. I will not be able to take a look around by October. I know that. So this might be my window after October. Okay, it's get worse. <laughs> okay, so but within the year, we'll have some action on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, where's my 
here we go. Okay. So that brings us back down to the COVID update, uh, any uh, update on prior grants, other COVID topics for you, Jen? Um, I'll just say that the update on the prior grants, um, just let folks know there were some grants that I believe people were um, uh, waiting for results. Um, and just, I want people to know that they weren't actually submitted and properly. So those grants are not going forward. The public health excellence and the CTC, um, uh, uh, there was a grant, some grant monies from the state. So I just wanted to update people on that. Um, and then um, on the agenda number two, the water update, um, there's all I can report is that there's two samples um, of our water here in the town uh, tested negative for PFAS. I don't know if that's how you say it, but the forever chemical. Yeah. So the polyfluoroalkaline substances. So that's a A plus, no, no PFAS in our waters. That's it. Okay. Yeah. And... The Waste Haulers Zero Waste Committee is going to come up in October. Um, I believe I forwarded Darcy Dumont's email to everybody. But what I wanted to also tell you, and I will forward it to you, but I didn't want to forward it to you in advance. They're going to, uh, she's going to have a, um, a the Recycling Committee, the Zero Waste uh, Hauler committee is going to do a presentation but i thought i found on on online i don't have the date but um veronica blanchard from the mass department of public health municipal assistance coordinator did a presentation on zero waste options for the town of amherst and i thought i would send that to you and Mimi Kaplan from our own Waste Reduction Enforcement Coordinator from the DPW had a very short, um, and it's not dated, um, presentation on the current situation and future scenarios of recycling in Amherst. And I just wanted to let you know, I will forward it to you. I didn't want to send it to you before I told you so you didn't get overwhelmed with all of this stuff. And that will be on our um, October uh, meeting. Just one quick question. I, I thought in Darcy's email, it referred to some attachments that she had with a study by the Zero Waste Committee and a study by Smith students. And yes. I didn't see those. Uh, maybe I missed something, but. That, that will come out before the next. Okay. I didn't, and then maybe I realized I read yeah. things in the wrong order and I didn't realize we didn't need Yes, them. because <laughs> the presentation isn't going to be till October. Right. Um, yeah, that, and then topics not anticipated by the chair. We got an email today from Michael Morris. And did you all read that about the regional school committee unanimously agreed to inquire about whether um, the board is, or the, and the health department are considering adding COVID-19 vaccine to the list of vaccines required for students to attend school. And that is consistent with the school policy. Um, uh, and I, uh, he forwarded that Puerto Rico did it. And I went and the actual uh, legislation done, the regulation done in, in Puerto Rico, I could only find it in Spanish. I could not find an English translation of it. The LA um, Unified School District Committee is meeting today to vote on it. And I found that, uh oh, um, another, find my notes now, a Another school district. Oh, it is the Culver City Unified School District um, in California. It's in LA County. Passed the the regulation so that by Friday, November nineteenth, twenty twenty one. Um, all students who are eligible, twelve and over, have to be immunized 
Um, and all of them have the, the two caveats that if it's medically contraindicated and for documented religious reasons. So um, I know we're not prepared to act on it today, but we really... We're, we're, we why, well, why are we not prepared to act on it today? All right, or we could act on it today. <laughs> Um, well, I think there's a couple of questions. One is, does it include staff? Another is, what's the date it would go into effect? And the third is, do, do we have to wait for uh, full authorization instead of emergency authorization? Uh, well, Pfizer <laughs> has full authorization. Excuse me? No, not for kids. 16 and up. 16 and up, yeah. 16 and up. Um, I, I did a lot of reading on this today. I can't answer those questions. Jen, I don't know. And Michael Morris is here, so we could ask him to talk um, about it. I, I can uh, tell you just, oh, yeah, what, what I, my, my perspective, um, I think it should be included, um, childhood vaccine. Um, it's not like hep B, it can, both affect the person and transmit. So it's one of these really important vaccines. I think it should also go forward to include any third dose or booster, but I don't know if they're asking for that. I like the opt-out standards that the school has in place now. And I think we should wait for it to be approved by the FDA, but that's just, those are my beliefs. Jen, so, full approval, full approval, not, full not approval. emergency. That could take a so long time. A, they were saying a few months, right? Yeah. Kids for kids a few months. Okay. Michael no. Morris no, is on. I don't know if he wants to speak to us. Michael, do you want to speak? He might be multitasking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, to, to mandate it, that's what I was thinking, you know, hopefully, you know, we'll still vaccinate under the emergency use, you know, but to mandate yes. it, you know, it, yeah, that's just my, my opinion. Mindy has her hand raised. Oh, sorry, that's a mistake. I'll lower it. <laughs> <laughs> you want to comment? Um, my gratitude to, for your thoughtful deliberation and also my gratitude to the schools because I think that Mike has done an incredible job as a superintendent, um, kind of seeing what the public health needs are, wanting to keep his students, his staff safe and trying to navigate sometimes a state government that's not been very cooperative with school districts, much to my displeasure. So thank you. I, 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 Jen, Mike, could, Mike has Jen, could, uh, Hand raised, uh -huh. Mike Morris. Go. Okay, Mike, is he unmuted? Allowed to talk. Yeah, I don't okay. see everybody. There he is. He Mark. should be able to speak. Can Mike, you hear you? me? Yes. 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 No, yes. Okay. Yeah, the okay. only things just in terms of the questions, sorry, I'm on my phone, so I don't know how the connection will be. Um, that the FDA has fully approved uh, the vaccine for students ages 16. Can you still hear me? Yes. 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 Um, ages 16 and up. I mean, I think the expectation for 12 plus that I've served uh, just in the press, I don't have <laughs> insider baseball, right? They don't share that with me is, is probably a couple weeks away or a month away for the 12th. Oh, we lost. We lost you. Okay. Uh, here you go. Okay. I can try to get on by a computer now that I just Actually, got you're, you're back. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, mm -hmm. so what I was saying is 16 plus has the full FDA approval uh, and that does affect, you know, implement, or we do have students who are 16 plus in our school system, the 12 to 15 from what's been publicly reported uh, in the press, not because I know any more than anyone else, people anticipate within a month uh, that the 12 plus will receive full approval. Um, in terms of staff, we did, uh, by we, it's really the school committee and I, mostly the school committee, did talk about a vaccine mandate uh, for staff, and they plan to vote on a policy around staff vaccine mandate uh, two weeks from tonight, actually. Um, so I know that they're, they're doing some wordsmithing, um, but uh, I think there was a broad support last night from the school committee on the staff end. Um, that doesn't require uh, the Board of Health piece, because that's an employment piece, not 
uh, around students, which would involve the Board of Health uh, vote for us to proceed. I think I got, I think those are the questions uh, that I heard, but if I missed any, please let me know. What, what would it be reasonable in a date for it to go into effect, the, the mandate? Um, for the staff end, I know uh, originally they were thinking uh, the conversation last night, uh, I'll just put it that way, uh, talked, uh, you know, the original drafts at October 31st, I think now that they're not voting for two weeks, I think it's more likely to be sometime in um, November. Um, the examples I've seen like Los Angeles, uh, I think has their deadline for the second shot in mid-December. Um, Puerto Rico is a little, they were a little more aggressive. Um, I did look at that Spanish uh, one. Uh, Nancy, I do, I'm fortunate to have lots of people around me. Who, uh, my read skills are okay in Spanish, they're not great, but there are others who could help me with that. Um, but theirs went into effect. I mean, it was, it was in July. They were way ahead of the curve uh, on this particular uh, item. Um, and um, so, you know, that's what we've seen so far. You know, a lot of the staff ones that have gotten passed is a number of districts in the last two weeks in Massachusetts that have passed staff mandates and sort of that late October to mid November is what we're seeing, uh, at least Los Angeles, which is voting tonight. Uh, I know that what's on their docket to vote on, I think the is December 19th or December 15th, something in that uh, vicinity for full vaccination for, um, for students. So that's what's out there. Um, certainly, uh, I've been, you know, for better or worse, right, I've been very uh, emphatic uh, for quite some time now about being an advocate for vaccines. Uh, certainly, we trust your judgment on the student part. I'm not trying to overstep my boundaries, but, um, you know, I think that's why it came up at school committee is everyone's realizing the benefits, as Ms. Brown said, of um, not just of, of the hospitalizations, which is obviously our largest concern, but about spread. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so that's sort of where the school committee dialogue uh, kind of came from last night. And, and according to policy, it's, it's not the school committee or my decision. It really is the board of health, local board of health decision, um, along with the health director uh, that would make that decision. And then we would implement, you know, whatever it is or isn't, you know, whatever you decide, uh, you know, we are clear we're not you. We're not a board of health. We're not experts in this area, though everyone's been thrust into this, uh, you know, in the last 18 months. But we're so fortunate to have uh, you all to guide us along the way in many, many, many areas of this pandemic. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. And I looked up the best of my ability for the um, LA one for the vote today, and that they want um, want it as 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 Mike said um, by December thirty first. All over twelve fully vaccinated. If your extracurricular program like band, which would be spewing, they want the second dose by um, the thirty first of October. There's proof of vaccine to be on campus, and for um, thirty days after the twelfth birthday, uh, uh, the uh, child has to have the first shot. And nationally, we cannot have a national school vaccine requirement. The 10th Amendment puts it all to the states. Um, and the states make their regulations to protect the public health. And in Massachusetts, um, the boards of health have to uh, protect it. Um, for exemptions in Massachusetts, we have religious and medical reasons, no philosophical reasons. Some states have philosophical reasons. Um, and so that's what I spent my day looking up. Other we just Can we just do, you know, agree to the, let, let the school decide the things like the, the day that it goes into effect and just say, we approve of a vaccination requirement for students. I just had a question from Mike. Can I ask that? Yes. Um, in Los Angeles, they said that people who are vaccine hesitant would be able to um, attend school remotely. I don't know, is that something that you have considered um, in, in Amherst? I know the, the, de the governor is not really in favor of any kind of remote education this year. Yeah, um, I think he's muted and I'm not, okay. 
Um, yeah, I can okay. I can answer that. So uh, that's not an option. There were, I think, six or seven districts around the state, um, all of whom are larger than us, uh, I believe, who created remote options. Um, it had to be an own remote school with its own remote principal. Um, and uh, no one in Hampshire or Franklin County uh, participated in that uh, that program. So students options could be to go to uh, there are two virtual schools in Massachusetts that are schools mm -hmm. of choice. Um, but uh, it's not we don't have a uh, we're not allowed right now to have a virtual option. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. What would you like to do, Steve? Do you want to make the motion? Sure, sure. Okay. I, <clears throat> I move that the Board of Health adds COVID vaccination to the list of vaccines that are required in the school. And we'll leave up to the school to decide on the dates and details. Mike, does that meet your requirements? Yeah, I mean, it's it's what the board, this board feels. I think we certainly could have a conversation uh, at the school committee level at our next meeting about the details uh, that you're describing. Um, so, um, you know, we, we, we trust you on that. And I think if, if the board ended up voting, whether it's tonight or at a future meeting, uh, along these dimensions, we would have a discussion and we would probably invite Ms. Brown to join us for that uh, if she was amenable um, to talk about sort of implementation details um, on that. So um, sort of if the board feels like adding the this particular vaccine to the school requirements is a good idea, uh, then we certainly can uh, work on the details at a later date. And certainly, you know, Ms. Gilbert or any other board members could participate. I, I, I don't want to speak for the chair of the school committee. I feel like I can, though, that we would certainly invite uh, the participation of, you know, the board chair and or uh, the director. Mike, would it help you if we did specify some of these or not? Um. It's uh, it's I'm I'm a little anxious to answer explicitly without the board, uh, you know, my my school committee, uh, yeah. being present on this meeting. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But uh, you know, it may be helpful to this is just uh me speaking again. I don't want to represent the the, the committee. Uh, if you were going to vote this to have a no later than date, because that probably gives enough leeway for the board and myself to then work on details. Um, sort of the open-ended piece is probably harder for us. Okay. Yeah, and like- again, If that means that you need to meet another time or, you know, it you know, can't happen tonight, that's, that's certainly up to you all. But I think my instinct is, I know later than is, is probably the right level of specificity. Yeah. Like no later than November 1st or something. Yeah, that, uh, I mean, I'm not going to make a judgment on the, the specific date, but yeah, I think uh, my instinct is that feels aggressive to me. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, um, but given just where we are in September and that the, the school committee won't meet again until uh, two weeks from now to work on implementation, um, just when you start counting the days, it starts getting pretty tight and we would want to work with Ms. Brown on a clinic, which she was so wonderful in supporting us with for last year. You know, there, there's some logistics around equity and access that we'd want to put into place to make sure that we're giving everyone, you know, full ability to um, to receive the vaccine. What Maybe no later than December, December 1st. December like, 1st. like around Thanksgiving. <laughs> December, <laughs> how about December 1st? Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, if, and should we specify, yeah. I think we should specify that it, it would be fully FDA approved or that we wouldn't do what Los Angeles did and require it of, of the 12 to 15s at this point. I think it should be full. I really think it should be full approval because you're going to need some buy-in from, there's going to be a few people that are going to be, have a problem and the full approval will make a difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay. Um, quick question. Anna. We are talking about uh, 
children as school children right less than 16 where no. the vaccine is not available at right no we're not talking about and, those uh, right now only no? as I, I think I, maybe it has to be worded to be when it is fully full fda approved but per age group i mean it's going to be uh, something that changes over time because because i think soon the 12 to 15s will be fda approved and eventually you know younger but I think I think we should stick with the full FDA approval as it rolls out. If anyone wants right. to come in who's younger or twelve, and then we can, of course, vaccinate. We certainly want to um, encourage the vaccine. I mean, already eighty yep. percent of students seem to be vaccinated, which That's is right. fabulous. I I think you know if you are deciding on a specific date to say no longer than we are assuming that it will be fully you know uh, approved before that so I, I i my recommendation is i think the school should take that decision depending upon what their requirements are because there's so many parameters uh, they probably will know the date by the time when the next school committee meets uh, i think they should take proactive efforts in that you know rather than we deciding on a date I think I think the date, Mike, is this correct? The date is for you to have the policy in place. So um, I I think there's, you know, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to follow the dialogue. Um, I'm getting on my laptop. It'll be a little easier than my phone uh, now that I'm uh, back at home. Um, I, I think what would be helpful if you're gonna pass um, pass a motion like that is for us to get a sort of end date of when you think students who are eligible for what I'm hearing is full FDA approval um, should have be fully vaccinated. Um, and I think the next step after that would be the school committee understanding this uh, mandate from the health board could then implement a policy at the school committee level to work on details of uh how that would be implemented um but like the la one which is not, not i'm not saying it's perfect it try to set, it tries to set a date and a deadline which then the school committee could backtrack from to say okay if, if you know i'm going to make up a date that's not i think in the realm of possibility for you all so that it's it i'm not leading you anywhere um like may 1st and then we say oh, okay may 1st by may 1st okay then we need to have our policy in place by february 1st we need to do clinics in march and april right um so I think that's in my head, probably what would be most helpful if you're gonna move forward with this is uh, try to send a set of when you think students should be reasonably, a reasonable timeline for vaccination. And then I'll work with the school committee uh, on implementation of it. Does that so, make sense? Yes, yeah. Yeah, so LA, <laughs> LA has it for December 31st. So, if we gave you two additional months, that would be February 28th. What Can I you... ask, uh, is there a winter break or some breaks coming in for the fall semester or something like that? That could be a trigger point we could use, you know, so when they come back in January or to join the school, that could oh, be it's... a motivation. Well, uh... Um, February vacation is February, uh, the week of February 21st through the 25th. So February 28th would be the comeback day from that break. The, the, the Pfizer vaccine, is it being administered in physicians or PCPs offices? Because I don't think so. This is going to be a clinic that we're going to be doing, I think. So... Pharmacies have it. Pharmacies. Yeah, CVS. Pharmacies. But I think, you know, it's something that we could offer um, as, a, as a clinic. I don't know what yeah. the, you know, the numbers are going to be, but I'm thinking sort of logistically, you know, there's a lot going on with flu vaccine, and then the students are also getting updated with their other mandated vaccines at their doctor's offices. And then you hit all the holidays. I'm just so, you know, if, if it could be after, like around February, one final clinic, just to wrap things up. I mean, that's just an idea. So then what about March 
31st. Seems so far away. I know. I was just going to say. Know. You want it sooner? Yeah, we do. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought you wanted it later. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> we could definitely get a clinic, you know. Okay. Together before the end of the, the calendar year. Okay. So if LA is voting today and it's going to be December 31st, what if we do January 31st? That gives the school board two more meetings to figure that out. And we don't have 600,000 students either. No, no, no. no. So I want it to be doable, but I don't want so much time that, that we're, we're losing this golden opportunity to prevent spread. Because my daughter, my daughter is in uh, teaches in in Belchertown in the kindergarten, and after two weeks in school, she said, "Is it inevitable that we're all going to get all the kids under twelve are going to get it?" Because <laughs> you know the kid, she said there was one kid positive in kindergarten. She said, "And the kids wear the mask, but they fall down, they get wet. Um, you know, the mandate doesn't help the littler kids, but if it's twelve and over, mm -hmm. it." it it'll help families yeah mm -hmm. yeah sooner more, you can surround these little or kids with vaccinated people the better right yeah. right so should we do january 31st what exactly is it that will be ha will happen on january 31st or by then a plan or or actual vaccination a actual vaccination right actual vaccination yeah. Two weeks before that, they have to finish their doses. Well, that's for the school committee to, to you know, they can yeah, say yeah. you have to have a, your first dose by then. The school committee can work out the little bits like the LA district is. But if we're going to say January 31st, we have to say what it is we're asking by January 31st. Be fully vaccinated or to have the second yeah. dose by then. It, you know, I, more I think about this, I, maybe we should not even try this because, you know, the, the full approval is an issue. Johnson & Johnson has one dose, blah, blah, blah. I mean, well, no, Johnson & Johnson, the only one that's been approved is Pfizer. And it's Pfizer for 12 and uh, for 16 and up and 12 and over are getting it. And the LA says that first dose shall be admitted, administered uh, within 30 days after their 12th birthday. And they're using not the FDA approval, but we can say the FDA approval and then they can roll what they need to it. If we sit back, it, it's another month or two or three that kids aren't getting vaccinated. And the more people that are vaccinated, the better chance we have. You know, South America is doing a much better job right now than the United States on this stuff. <laughs> and we talked to friends in Quito. They started immunizing in June. That's when they got the vaccine. Their school is remote or hybrid. You, they started age-wise and, and risk-wise, and it gets... It gets you get notified the date, the time, and you show up and you get immunized. And everybody's wearing masks and nobody's fighting. No, I'm not going to get vaccinated. So we need to start pushing people to get vaccinated. Uh, I think uh, get any control of this this pandemic. So. Uh, the school is in, looks like the school is enthusiastic about this. Yes. They are looking for some sort of a, uh, a general okay from the Board of Health. Yes. But I also wanted to give the decision making to the school committee, you know, so that they can decide to go early or later, depending upon their logistics and infrastructure or whatever it is. And also they will, they, they're competent in terms of looking for what exact the dates when the FDA approval happens and when they could do that. I think we don't have that information on 
implementation and all the timeliness. But if we can, if we can just have a general um, memo to them saying, we agree that you should you should go ahead and make this one some sort. And then please feel free to uh, follow uh, so deadlines, you know, what, whatever you feel for different age groups or availability of the FTA. I think that might be a better option rather than we coming up forcefully with a particular date. Um, Mike has his hand raised because he asked for a date. Yeah. And, and I have to say, I worked in college health and we looked to public health to say what we needed to do, what schedule we needed to follow and so on and so forth. And, you know, it, it, it really is a public health thing to say what, what this is. It, you know, it's not really an educational policy for, to my, in my mind. So Mike, do you have your hand raised about the date or any more information you want to give us? Yep. Um, so I'm sorry to make things complicated. Um, I think um, Mr. Randier uh, made, I think, a really good point. Um, and again, because the school committee is not here tonight, I don't know, they might want to weigh in on the dates. So uh, I apologize if I complicated matters. Um, and, you know, perhaps uh, because we have a little bit of time here, there can be some, you know, I think if, if this board is going to vote to uh, recommend and establish that this is a required vaccine, the school committee can then consider that. Uh, and perhaps if they have questions, they can follow up or we can do a joint meeting on the topic. Uh, but because they're not in this call, I'm just, I probably uh, would have loved to take, and probably you all would have liked to not have this 15 minutes. I should have taken that back piece back around the timing. Um, I think the overall concept is probably the most important thing for you all to make a decision about. Uh, and then bring it to school committee where they can talk about implementation. They may want to come back to you uh, for your feedback on timeline. Um, but I think one thing at a time might be the more important way to go. So I apologize, I, you know, hearing the conversation, I, I didn't mean to steer anybody down. A, a okay. Path that wasn't okay. So I'm, we were putting the dates in because you said, oh, we need a date. Yeah, but remember, oh, well, I'm the one that asked. I thought I was being helpful <laughs> yeah. by saying, I, was, I said, you know, is there any more specificity? I should just let it go. So, okay. <laughs> okay, now back, we know what we're to you, do. back to you, Steve. Oh, no. And thanks, Tim, for bringing that up. Yeah. <laughs> okay, back to you, Steve, for your uh, your motion. We're just saying that we, we move to add COVID vaccinations to the list of vaccines that are required for attendance at the public schools with... Um, details to be left up to this, details of implementation to be left up to the school board. Do we want to add um, upon FDA approval? Full FDA approval. Yeah. Okay. Because right now it's 16 and over. This is a regional issue too, is not, is it not? It would be for the um, middle school and high school regionally. Which is, which is the only place we're going to be this whole year. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess we can put our two cents in. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, so Steve, you're going to repeat the motion. <clears throat> we move to add COVID vaccinations when the vaccine has full FDA approval to the list of required vaccines for public school attendance. Second. I second it. Any more discussion? Let's vote. Maureen, you're there smiling. Hi. <laughs> Tim, you're smiling. Hi. Steve, you're busy writing. Hi. And Nancy, I. Okay. I think I'm thinking the end is near. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 7.36. Okay. That covers... Oh, I lost my agenda now. I moved all my papers around. That covered everything on the agenda. Or, Jen, do you have anything else that we didn't get on the agenda? No, thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to go up. I have another one I have to go on. I have another one. I have. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. 
So um, our next meeting is October 14th. I have to, let me make myself a big note. I'll have, I'm gonna eat and then I will do the H9246, whatever it is. And I will get the zero waste out to you within the next day. And then I need a motion to adjourn unless anyone else wants to add anything. I'll make a motion to adjourn this meeting. Second? I'll I'll second. second. Yep. Okay, Tim? Aye. Steve? Aye. Maureen? Aye. Nancy, aye. And thank you all very much. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jen. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. Bye. On top of everything. <coughs> Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye -bye. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you.